Okay. All righty. So, um, great. Welcome to the session. We're going to do um, as long as it takes, really. Um, we've got a range of things that we're going to have a go at this afternoon for our weather session. Um, I'm going to start with, let me just pop some slides up for you, and then we will swap that over. Find you all again. There you go. Um, there we go. Screen share. <clears throat> Okay, so hopefully you can see the main screen, which is in full screen with a picture of a hurricane on there. Yep. Yeah. Ah, okay, brilliant. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank so this know. is what we're going to have a look at. Um, this session objectives, this is what um, Doug and I sort Sorry, of agreed. Kath. Yeah. I, I've got everyone's pictures over the top of your screen, but uh, not as normal. I think that's you, not. Bear with me. Let me go go. Is that better? Oh, perfect. Look at that. There we go. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you very much. Okay. There's the only, it's the only drama with having two screens. I'm never quite sure which one you're watching. I'm never quite sure which I'm watching either. So if I'm looking over here, it's because I've got another screen. It's not that I'm trying to ignore you. Okay, so we're going to have a look at what level of weather knowledge we need to impart to our students to make sure that they can stay as safe as possible and to make some good skippering and crew decisions. Um, how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to start with how well you know your weather. Like I just said in quick introductions, there is a quiz. Everybody loves a quiz. What I'm going to do is randomly split you into breakout rooms. I'm going to send a file and there are 15 questions that I want you to have a look at. Um, now, some of you are certainly those who have been ticking the yacht master, why am I sail, cruising instructor, why am I power tickets, should be able to answer all of those questions. No pressure, just saying. Um, the, yeah, I was going to say, ah! Oh my Lord, no pressure. Um, for some of you, it might be some good revision. I think I'm looking now, Helen's looking absolutely terrified at me. Um, but, <laughs> but for some of you, it should be some good revision. But what I want to do, I will randomly put you into the breakout rooms. Um, so hopefully it will be a bit of a discussion. The idea is to get from each other some knowledge. So if, you know, if it's something that you're not particularly familiar with, then have that discussion as well. So we're gonna do a little bit of a quiz. And when I show you the questions, the answer is not just to answer the question, but come up with oh. where do you think it fits in the syllabuses where would you be teaching that so if I said to you for example how would you describe a slight C where would we be teaching that if I ask you where we would describe a very rough C at what point might we, might we be teaching that across all of the syllabuses um, we'll look at the different level of weather knowledge for different REA courses I have been back into all the syllabuses because um, I thought it was about time I refresh my memory on what I should be teaching at day skipper theory and yacht master theory and across the practical courses as well. So I've been digging in on all the syllabuses. I've also been in the National Sailing Scheme book as well. So dinghy sailors, please, hopefully I've pulled out the right bits and pieces, but please feel free to correct me if I haven't. Um, and then we'll have a look at some top tips and tricks for getting your students to understand weather and how you can be that little bit more engaging, perhaps if it's something that's not really you. Um, I think a couple of you said you've got your patter, you've perhaps got your slides that you use or however you teach it maybe you go this is it and you're looking terrifiedly at your students going please don't ask me a difficult question because outside of what is behind me I'm not sure I know okay and there's plenty of people teaching in that way and also finish up with where can you go to get some more information so where can I send you to go and get more information where can you go and upskill your knowledge because let's face it the higher up the grades you're going from an instructor perspective, then the more the more difficult the C's are perhaps going to be when you're you're heading on out. So again, it's about thinking, what is my knowledge right now? And where do I need to go with that knowledge? What are the gaps in my knowledge? OK, because we can't know everything. OK, so first up, um, I'm going to say to you, how well do you know your weather? OK, now, if you're looking at the slide there, let me just push this to if you're looking at the slide there, um, that's not the quiz, right? Okay, it's not the quiz. So before you start answering the, the pictures, they're just some pictures to give you an idea of what this is going to be like. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a slide, a PDF through the chat, okay? So if I can work out how to get to my chat, I can go to my file. I'm going to drop you a PDF file into the chat. That should be coming over now. So it's in PDF, which should mean that it should open on everybody's devices. There are 15 questions on there. What I am going to do is pop you into breakout rooms completely randomly. 
and give you a little time to have a chat about the questions. And like I say, not just what is the answer, but how might you teach it? What might the issues be and where might you be teaching that? Okay, so if I just on for this, I wanted to see how we go. How do we find that then as an activity? Testing, yeah. Testing. Yeah, yeah. really good. We could talk about that for a long time. That could just keep us going for hours. <laughs> so it's a sneaky way of doing a session, really, isn't it? Here's a quiz, knock yourselves right out, okay? <laughs> it's, a, it's a lazy, lazy way of teaching. But useful conversations? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, all of you, I, I kind of did a quick tally that when you were doing your quick introductions earlier. Um, I think we've got maybe eight of you who were more sailing, four dinghy, one or two motor, maybe four power, one PwC. I know that there's more of you and you were across lots of different things. What was interesting, nobody really claimed to be teaching the shore-based scheme. Anyone teaching base skipper theory? Ah, yes. <laughs> now it comes out then, Caroline. Anyone else wanting to put their hands up to that? Oh, good one, Mark. So we've got Caroline and Mark. All righty. Um, and I think, Paolo, I think you mentioned it as well at the at the beginning, didn't you, that you were um, using the, the shore-based schemes as well. So, so all of the questions that were on the quiz are taken from the syllabuses that we will teach, whether it be shore-based, whether it be then applying that shore-based knowledge into a practical activity, okay? So there's no sneaky trick questions in there. They are all ones, and, and I know this because I went back through all the syllabuses, just in case, just in case my, my views had changed, which as I'm sure you'll say they did. So let's have a little chat about how we, we went through them. So the first three questions were around what does the term soon mean? How would you describe moderate visibility? And how would you describe a rough sea state? So these are more about those definitions. And I think my point was really to some of you guys in the rooms, how helpful is it that you tell me that a rough sea state is say two and a half to four meters? Not very. <laughs> so it's day one, a day skipper theory and you decide to teach weather. And we go, right, so this could be four to six, you know, two to four metres. And I go, well, hang on, you said the boat was going to be like 40 foot long. So that's all right, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, bringing stability, stability of the boat and how that affects wave size, etc. <clears throat> so for me, it's about how do you get across? And I think, Gary, you mentioned it really good. You know, it's either the height of the room or the height of the house. Well, already I weighed the height, the size of the height of the room is worrying me somewhat. Before I before I set to see almost no matter what, and if I've got a choice, because remember we're supposed to be doing pleasure booting. I think most people are looking more pleasure booting than they are um, commercial A to B kind of booting. So how do you go through those definitions and try and teach them? For me, I would pick out some of the really helpful and useful ones. What are the definitions associated with making a decision? So if something is soon in a forecast, anything that's imminent, I mean, that's, that's just a huge decision. That's, if it's, it's a gay lay imminent, then it's really run for cover, go home. If it's something soon, what's the decision that I'm trying to make as my, let me just put that away. Um, what's the decision that I am trying to make based on the sailing that I am doing? So if something is coming in soon, why is it important? What did you come up with? God, you're gonna to have to tell me. You're gonna to have to fess up to at least have an answer to some of them. Six, six to twelve hours on the soon side of things. Brilliant. Okay, six to twelve hours from when? When it was issued. Time of issue. Brilliant. Yes. And what's the key thing then? From the time of issue. Time of you, issue. Yeah. Yeah. If you say six to twelve hours, students yeah. look at their watch and go, "All oh, right, well, it's three o'clock. I've got loads of time now, haven't I? Fabulous." Mm. Actually, mm -hmm. when was the forecast issued? You know, we've got the Met Office issuing the inshore waters four times a day. So likely this was from the 12 o'clock forecast at lunchtime. So are your students able to understand that it's not just about reading the numbers or reading the words and then going getting a crib card that says this means that? It's about the when was the forecast issued. And if you apply that more into, and you'll see a little bit later how the, the courses sort of uh, fall out, but if we look at more at the intermediate power booting at the day skipper practical level, that's where we're talking about students starting to make some decisions. And that's where we're talking about the being able to interpret a forecast. 
And I think dinghy sailors, don't shoot me down. I'm, I'm trying. I am putting my best efforts into, into understanding your world because I'm rubbish at a dinghy. Um, but that's more about that day cruising type activity that you're looking at when you're looking at those sort of the day cruising courses where you're now expecting people to be able to make that decision and perhaps feed it into an overall plan. So back in the day, for any of those who are old enough to remember the old fashioned Yacht Master syllabus that had a whole meteorology paper on it, that was, I don't know, an hour and a half. It, it seemed like a lifetime, quite frankly, however long it was. Everybody had to learn verbatim, wrote what all of the definitions meant and be able to recall them like that and write them down. OK, do we still need to do that? For me, yes, some of them, but not all of them. OK, so when I'm looking at how would you describe moderate visibility, good visibility, let's go sailing. Poor visibility, let's not go sailing, maybe. OK, moderate visibility is a decision point, isn't it? Do I go, do I not go? How far does that mean I can see? Okay. And I'll come up with some, some tips as to, I'll go through these and then I'll come up with some tips as to how I think that you could you could best teach them, okay? How are we doing so far? Two out of two, everyone? Yep. Awesome. Um, when we're looking at a rough sea state then, what's the most important thing about this rough sea state? <laughs> they don't want to be in it. <laughs> right. How many times do you have people who would perhaps come to one of your lessons and say, yeah, I've been out in a rough sea. And you go, have, have you? Are you sure? Do you know that a rough sea is kind of this big? It's like the size of, and they go, oh, well, it wasn't that big. I say, ah, what you mean to tell me is that you've been out in something that was a little bit more uncomfortable than you liked. It was a bit more yeah. bumpy than you really wanted it to be. You were literally, your, your fear factor started kicking in and therefore it was rough, right? And so for me, that's what I'm trying to get people to understand. If we talk about a moderate sea state, that already is a bit bumpy. Now I know it depends on what boat you're in. I know it depends on how far offshore you're looking at going, but you know, setting out to sea in a moderate sea state is already going to be a little bit bumpy. Now fab, if I want to stick my dry suit on and take the rib out and go rough water handling, woohoo, you know, brilliant. But actually, if it's, um, if I'm teaching, say, a helmsman's course, this is the first time any of my students have been on a boat. So I'm going to say anything a little bit bumpy or a little bit rolly is not really going to enthuse them to come back tomorrow. That's a really rubbish business model, right? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> then they want a <laughs> refund. Then they go home and you're yeah. like, oh, damn it, yeah. you know? So for me, it's about what are those decision points? It's a moderate sea state really is the decision point. Anything with rough in it, probably go find something else to do. Now, I'm not saying that people won't end up in a rough sea state or that there might be areas where that is OK. But realistically, what are you trying to get your students to understand? It's going to be damned uncomfortable. You're going to be damn miserable. And how long is it going to be rough for? It's going to be rough for a short period of time because the weather is changing for the better. OK, you might want to chance it. If it's going to be rough because there's a whopping great big depression coming in and it's just on moderate now and it's going to last for the next 12 hours. Yeah. Good luck with motivating your students through that, quite frankly. There's only so much chocolate everybody can eat, isn't there? There is. Once, once you've gone through your chocolate biscuits, where, where's your morale then? <laughs> so um, how did we do then with the inshore waters forecast? How far offshore is it valid to? Uh, 12 miles. 12, yeah, 12 little miles offshore. Why is that important? Not going further than that, then you don't need to be worrying about further out. Absolutely. How, how many of the courses that you are running or how much of the teaching that you are doing is really going more than 12 miles offshore? Not a lot. On my 25 acre lake, <laughs> absolutely none of it. <laughs> 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 Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. So whilst people say to me, oh, it's only the inch of waters, it's only valid. Yeah, really? So perhaps other than more longer trips where we're perhaps moving into more coastal skipper territory, even on a yacht master prep, why would they go more than 12 miles offshore? I'm supposed to be making my students work really, really hard at showing me that they can do all the drills and they've got all the skills. Not that we can go sailing across the Ogden. So really, other than a coastal skipper, are we really going that far, perhaps? 
Now, I know that there will be times mm. when we'll go perhaps along the coast and we might do a slightly longer trip along the coast. But we're then talking about, um, for those certainly in the UK, um, going across to the Channel Islands or going across to, to France. Well, that's already a 12 hour sail, isn't it? Let's say that's already a big chunk of that course that you're taking up to go and do that passage. OK, um, we then said what wind strength does a shipping forecast area turn red? This caught a few people out this morning. Any thoughts on that one? <laughs> Go for it, anyone? Is it 4-6? Oh, got you all again. Okie dokie. So this is from a shipping forecast, inshore waters, red line around the outside, 4-6. Absolutely. Right. Shipping forecast, big boats, looking at Gale 8. Okay, that's where we're looking at those boxes go red. See, told you they were all there for a reason. <laughs> all there for a reason but what are we encouraging students to do i'm encouraging them to look at the shipping forecast if they're going perhaps a little bit further but even on the inshore waters if there's a big red line around the outside their decision should be should i go to sea today okay. not i am going to see how rubbish is it going to be <laughs> sorry gary you've got a you've got a point there gary no, no uh, it's not a point. I just want to just clarify. Um, the question was for um, shipping forecast yeah. um, turning red. So that is uh, full date. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because they're big boats. Shipping. Oh, big. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just we, we yeah. I think Alex came up or someone came up with full date and we all agreed. Um, so that's cool. We actually got oh, it right. Good. I'm just checking. Yeah. I, I hear you. Yeah, there we go. Woohoo! <laughs> There's a few celebrations going on in the bottom of the screen there. We, yeah, so, we got it right because we misunderstood the question. <laughs> oh, bargain. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> In, I, have to say, I was going off the colours of XC weather. There we go. And so much of what we have now is all colour focused, isn't it? No matter how that weather is put on, it's all colour focused. So if I'm saying to my students, perhaps tonight for your homework, I want you to go and have a look at the weather forecast and come back tomorrow with a decision on whether we should go to sea or not, you know, um, I want them to look at the inshore waters. If it's got a red line around it, I want them to start thinking, okay, if I was going out on my own, maybe this isn't for me. Now, don't get me wrong, I get that there will be local areas where perhaps um, a strong southerly wind might be coming in over um, some land, you might get some shelter. I get that there will be local areas where you could go and do that. But what I want is the students and yourselves to look at it and go, but should I be doing it? Dead easy, red line, big decision point. OK, yeah, anything that comes up red on, the, on you know, gaily on the uh, on the shipping forecast. Good luck with that. Now, you may be tucked away somewhere, which may mean that you can do that. But you're already into some quite breezy conditions. And, you know, as well as I do, it can be incredibly unpredictable. So how are you getting your students to look at things and say, oh, decision for say, definitely not. Definitely not. OK. Force five on an inch of waters or for six when the red line goes around it, probably not, yeah? No lines around the inch of waters, happy days. Yeah, happy days. Might still be a little bit bumpy in places, but already happy days, okay. Um, then we snuck a fog one in. Fog from behind me, some beautiful fog behind me there. We snuck an advection fog one in. What is it and how does it dissipate? You had 50-50 counter on this one, didn't you? What did we go for? Warm, moist air blowing over a cold sea surface generates it. Okay. Um, how does it dissipate? How are we going to get rid of it? Change your wind direction. Okay. Significant. Yep. So when we're talking about any kind of fog, for me, it's keep it really simple. To get fog, we have to have something cold or cooling and something warm and wet. Because if we don't have warm and wet, we can't have fog, can we? So the easiest way I explain it is if you have a shower and you get out of your shower and you open the shower door, the mirror fogs up, right? And then you close it and the fog goes away. If you open the door again, what happens? Yeah. Fogs up. Yeah. <laughs> fogs up. So already we're talking about how does that happen? We've got that cold mirror surface. We've got that warm, wet air. Yes, there's whole loads of physics and clever stuff about how it condenses and what it does and so on. But what do people need to know? 
if we have a cold surface, a cold sea, and we have some warm air coming in over the top of it, we are going to generate fog. And everybody likes to think, oh, but fog burns off, right? Because that, that's kind of what we all learn, fog burns off, mm. so that on a foggy day, it will all burn away. Well, it's really important that we know that this won't, because if we add more heat, open the shower door again, just all fogs up, doesn't it? So it's, it's, getting, up, yeah. People, yeah, it's getting people to understand that what is the decision they are going to make? Would that mean a really foggy day, whole load of infection fog, whole load of sea fog, how is that going to affect taking a whole dinghy sailing course out, for example? Then what? Yeah. I mean, yeah. let's face it, sometimes some of the kids in dinghies are hard enough to keep track of in the best of times. So the last thing we want them doing is going hiding in fog, okay? So what's the decision? It's not going to get any better. So unless the weather is going to change, and now I'm saying, so go look, when does the weather change? When do I get a wind shift? When am I going to get a significant change in the weather? Because until then, it's not really going to change very much. Could be sat in for a few days. Okay. One of the things that um, I knew when I was doing quite a lot of teaching here from a lifeboat perspective, they said, but the fog is over the sea, Kat. so it's sea fog, right? I went, no. It's radiation fog that's sort of fallen over the sea, but it's over the sea, so it's sea fog. I said, but how is it going to go away? If it goes away by the sun shining on it, there we go, happy days. So again, do they need to know the ins and outs of all of it? Not really. What are some basic principles? And top tips for things like this, go look on things like the GCSE bite size. If it's good enough for teenagers, it's good enough for me to try and explain it. Yeah. They'll also have all sorts of um, like experiments that you can do. So if it does become a no sailing day and we have to stay ashore and do something else, perhaps there's something that I could have in that lovely little toolbox of tricks that I pull out. OK, we'll have to yeah, tr tramp sorry. on. Yes, what? Just ask, we, we were debating, uh, well, I was debating, um, does the tide change having the effect on adventure and fog? We know the wind changes it, but if the tide changes it, does that make it's sense? A, it's the temperature of the sea. So unless it's giving you a different temperature of the sea, then no. I doubt it. Yeah, I would doubt it. Yeah, I doubt it. OK, just conscious of time. Like I say, we did go massively over. So um, if you'd only planned on doing an hour, um, then feel free to, to run away. But uh, we are recording it, so we can pop it up later. OK, coastal convergence and divergence. Probably the tricky question on here, right? How do we feel yeah. about that one? It's tricky. <laughs> Because what are you trying to explain? So I had a little go at this, but I'm really woolly. But it's it's all about the speed of the wind over land and water. Because over water, there's nothing stopping it, so it goes a lot faster. Over land, it slows down. But when it hits, it's like, if you think about like an emergency escape plane with the sand in the side of the road, you're kind of veering into that, veer or back. And that is the end of my explanation. <laughs> so, but brilliant. How many things did you just bring into that explanation that weren't just about coastal convergence and coastal divergence? We talked about wind speeds, it going faster over the land, it going slower, so faster over the sea, sorry, it going slower over the land. Something happens, there has to be some sort of shift. So that's probably to do with all the earth spinning. I mean, if anything shifts, it's easy just to blame it on the earth spinning, isn't it really? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's a really easy one. It's because the earth spins and the students go, all right then, okay? So from that perspective, why is it important? I think to know if it's, if it's going to pick up along the coast or if it's going to drop along the coast. Sure. So from that perspective, and dinghy guys, probably even more so important because what we're saying now is that the wind speeds we're going to get, and I think someone mentioned it in the breakout rooms, are not what's on the forecast. <laughs> So I'm all ready for whatever force I'm expecting and I've got my, my boats all rigged and everything and then I'm getting completely clattered by this wind that came out of nowhere and thinking, well, where did that come from? What's the effect it might have on the sea state? Okay. Um, and how might a sea breeze then? So on to the next question. Nice segue into that one, Kat. Um, how might the sea breeze affect your sailing trip? This has got to be a question for those in Greece and Portugal, really, hasn't it? <laughs> Windier in the afternoon <laughs> when it's got nice and warm. So, yeah, we picked the sun's picked up, it's heated the land up, and we've created that sea breeze. Do I need to know the ins and outs of that sea breeze? 
not really, because I'm not a meteorologist. What is the impact on me? The wind will pick up. It's going to pick up in this way. And I'll show you some pictures a little bit later. But if I'm bringing that breeze on to the land, that's what's going to make it you know, more difficult. And I lose track of the amount of people who say to me, oh yeah, I've got my ICC. I hired a boat when I was on holiday. I picked the boat up around 11 o'clock and I went out of the harbour, it was really flat. When I brought it back at three o'clock, I could hardly park the boat, it was really bumpy. What happened? And I go, well, the sea breeze, you know? And they went, well, that's not in the powerboat level two syllabus, is it? Well, I no, not, not really. <laughs> So, I think for us, it's important to point out as well that it's not always on the forecast. There we go. So to point out, okay, three o'clock, set your alarm. Now everybody wait 10 minutes. There you go. That wasn't on the forecast. Yeah, no, absolutely. So well, again, if you're saying to your students, and we'll talk about where we got our weather from, go get all this wonderful weather off the internet and the apps and windy and all these great places, that's not going to have your sea breeze on there, is it? No. No. So all of a sudden, how your boat is all rigged, great. And actually, if you've then got some novice students and you're saying, right, everybody, we're going to change all of this around because we've got too much sail up or, or whatever it is. Yeah, it's suddenly a mm, run around everybody kind of thing, isn't it? OK. Um, on to catabatic winds then. So um, catabatic winds, for those of you who might be starting to thinking, I've got no idea what this is. Definitely Yacht Master syllabus stuff. Catabatic winds, local effects, that kind of thing. Um, anyone having a go at catabatic winds? Chloe in Greece, very good. Sorry, say that again. <laughs> Chloe in Greece. We Chloe find this Greece. one easy. We find this one easy because um, the word kato in Greek means down. Nice. Okay. So, so it's the acceleration of the wind coming down like a tall landmass or. So, so flowing down a mountain, perhaps flowing down a landmass, that kind of thing. What's the so what for it? What's it going to do? Um, just getting getting yourself closer to shore is obviously you're going to have more of that effect. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, with so coastal maybe, navigation, yeah. important. So maybe I haven't got as much wind. I might go chase it if yeah. I'm if I'm going looking for a bit more breeze. But equally, I might understand that I'm going to get some more breeze. Okay, and what effect that might have, particularly if I end up perhaps with a little bit of wind over tide or something like that. That could be an issue. Okay, um, I will jump on. Um, where in a depression are we going to find cumulonimbus clouds? There's quite a discussion about this one. Where are you going to get your <laughs> cumulonimbus? Cold front. Cold, Cold front. front. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's shoving all that warm air aloft. It's creating those cumulonimbus. Cumulo meaning heap. Nimbus meaning rain bearing. That's why I say all about clouds. It's just learning some Latin. It's a heap of rain bearing cloud. Okay. One of the best ways you can teach um, clouds is to create like a card sort game, a picture of the cloud, what the name is, where you might find it, that kind of thing. OK, uh, how does your atmospheric pressure change then as the depression comes over you? Increases. So what are we thinking? So the whole depression is coming over you. What do you expect your barometer to do? Drop, drop to st steady, rise. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> drop, drop, steady, rise, a bit like the V that you see of this. So it's either a V or a bucket. It's a bit like being yeah. in a bucket. So it's going to drop, steady, rise. Okay. Because you can get people looking at what they are writing in a logbook around the barometer. And if they're saying, do you know, it's dropped quite a bit from the, from the last hour. And you has it. Good. Let's take, let's take some sales down then, shall we? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the thing. If, we're, you know, if I'm on a, on a motorboat, I might be thinking, now might be the time to either go and anchor over there or go home. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, we've done the pressure. So cirrus clouds then. Where will we find in cirrus clouds and what do they signify? What are they made of? Do you know? Ice. Ice, Ice because? They're way yeah, up. 40, really high. <laughs> big high clouds. Okay. Yeah. What are we actually looking? So if they're ice crystals, it's quite windy up there, right? So if it's icy crystals, they're like streaks in the sky, called you know, mares, tails, all that kind of thing. Loads of things that they're called, isn't it? We're looking for those big yeah. streaky clouds. Um, why am I bothered? Approaching on the front coming. Warm front. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And then <laughs> so warm front's coming over, I'm gonna get wet. <laughs> probably need to put a coat on if I didn't have one already yeah. need to put a coat on wind's going to start shifting okay um this is yeah a friend of a small power boat set in an ebb tide against the forceful southwesterly wind what would you advise what's the really short answer to this 
get a big boat. Get a big boat or lumpy. Lumpy or go to the pub. <laughs> yes. Yeah? Yes. yeah? Go to the pub. Yes. Can't go to the pub because of lockdown. Go take the dog for a walk or go home and watch a box set. Okay. Particularly here, and Andy will know this as well as I do, particularly here, if we have got a big ebb tide going down the channel at four or five knots and a big southwesterly wind coming up it, it's going to be horrid. And nobody <sighs> likes that, do they? Yes. Yeah, nobody yeah. likes it. Um, other than the Met Office, took that one away from you, other than your Met Office then, where did you get your five sources of weather forecast from? Internet. Internet, yep. The that, that, that knocks out quite a few, doesn't it? If you go for doesn't it, <laughs> for the internet. Sorry, Paolo. I was going to say the Yacht Club or the Marine Office. It was yeah. Got... yeah. So that's that's a good one. Anyone else? First guard. Yeah, possibly. Open your eyes. Now there's an idea. We could look out the window, couldn't we? Oh my lord. So some people kind of forget to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So the internet knocks out a whole lot. We've also got our VHF radio for our maritime safety information broadcast. We could tune in our long wave radio, I think, onto Radio 4 and go and get the shipping forecast, all that kind of thing. Um, the best one this morning was um, a slightly older gentleman who said, I used to have to buy the Telegraph and read the synoptics in the Telegraph before the advent of the internet. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So where did we have to go and get that information from? Okay, loads of different areas. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a sec. Um, what's the minimum weather knowledge then that you need to set to sea for a quick trip around the bay? What What does that person need to know? They need to know the um, how to read a forecast and to relate it to what it what's going to happen out there. They need to have an understanding that that wind direction is coming that way and it's going to be that speed and it's going to have that effect. Okay, so keep it really simple. Remember, we're talking about wind coming from a direction that is often new to people because we know where it came from. We've got no idea where it's going to for all reasons. We've talked about divergence, convergence, you know, land masses getting in the way or that kind of thing. So where is the wind coming from? How strong is it? Is it in our play zone? And I think in the um, power boating handbook, at the back of that, the table is really good because it basically says force one to three, great power boating weather. Force four, um, I think it's for the more experienced. Force five, do something else or something along those lines. And I think that's not a bad way of looking at it, is it? You know, you people are, there's a difference between people going out mile building because they're trying to get qualifications than people going out for fun and just setting to see. OK, so how did we do? out of 15 do you reckon any 15s out of 15 <laughs> no, it's all much. gone very quiet <laughs> not on a personal level but i think as a group we did quite well i have to say <laughs> yeah i think i think we did pretty well out of a group yeah gotta agree with gotta agree okay. with my teammate on that one <laughs> and what you can really see is it's a massive massive subject so when you're looking at teaching it or if you're looking at improving your knowledge, what is the so what? Because you can go learn stuff. There are loads of books. You can go learn stuff. What is the so what for you? OK, why do I need to know it? How is it going to help me? Are these just a really cool things? Like I actually looked it up and said, if you want to talk about, say, average air pressure, our average air pressure can have an effect of plus 63 centimetres to minus 37 centimetres on the, the mean sea level. How cool does that sound? <laughs> yeah, I'd have an audience in the pub, right? Um, but yeah, so there are other stuff like that. Whereas what do we really need to know? That the atmospheric pressure is perhaps going to change the sea level. Are you really going to go and measure it? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Maybe not. Because <laughs> um, whenever you do this, uh, whatever, your, your, whatever your student base is and whatever little knowledge they've got, that's the sort of fact that one of them will bring in and say, how come that happens then? And it's sort of like, oh, hang on a minute. Yeah, absolutely. So we think what's interesting, I'll pop the slide share up. I did um, a quick look through all of the syllabuses to pull out what we're actually supposed to be teaching and what we're actually supposed to know. Because I've done probably hundreds of day skippers and quite a few yacht master courses. And I teach the weather that I think day skippers should know. So actually reading the syllabus was a little bit different. So let me pop the screen share up for you. This is the level of knowledge for the theory. Oh, wrong one. There we go. 
This is the level of knowledge for the theory. So already what you can see is, maybe let me put you back up there. What you can see is, even if we look at essential nav and seamanship, and I appreciate most people do this online now rather than in a classroom. I think some of the sea cadets and that still sort of teach it in the classroom, but it's brilliant online. It is only an hour's worth of tuition. And it is only looking at the sources of forecast and the terms used in the forecast from a simple level, okay? And an idea of sea state. But if you look at the online course, it actually has got quite a lot of it in about where we get a forecast from, what the forecast mean, wind comes from a direction, what some of the numbers mean. But again, it's keeping it simple. OK, so do we skip a theory? Then we're supposed to be teaching three hours of weather. OK, and interestingly, it's at mostly bees, which is working knowledge. OK, appreciate on the practical, it's can do and understand. OK, but for this, it's A is a full knowledge, B is a working knowledge, C is an outline knowledge. So once we've moved into sources of, of, of broadcast weather, the knowledge of the terms then that we would use in shipping forecasts, and that involves also inshore waters, including the Beaufort scale and their significance to small craft. Again, that's where we come back to force five, small craft really probably shouldn't be out. So we're talking about that decision level there, aren't we? OK, but it is mostly bees for working knowledge. But most interestingly, it is only outline knowledge for highs, lows and fronts. So we don't need to get into such level of depth as when we look at the day skipper exams. It's about can you read a forecast and make a decision about whether I, would I go yes or no? Would I anchor in that bait because of that wind direction? Would I go on this trip or would I go somewhere else? Would I use this as a refuge? OK, and then when we get up to the coastal skipper yacht master theory level, it's six hours of tuition on weather. Now, I am absolutely loving that. I'm in my element. I could do six days of weather. And some people do. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> there are some people who just do it to death. OK, but look at what it is. It's mostly working knowledge. So this is an idea that you could apply it really rather than have a full understanding of it. We're now bringing in more things about pressure systems and frontal systems ability to interpret a shipping forecast okay what does that shipping forecast mean for me even getting your students to write a shipping forecast down and see whether they can write it down and then do something with it because you can hear it but they can't remember it right so what do they write down okay um the land and sea breezes start to come in there not so much at day skipper theory level um the sea fog although interestingly that's only an outline knowledge i'm not altogether sure why um, and then the use of a barometer as a forecasting aid, because if I say to you, where do you get your weather from? And you tell me that you've all got apps on your phone. I'm sure you could all tell me there's half a dozen weather apps on your phone. OK, um, well, what if we go a bit more offshore and that's not working anymore? Then what do we do? So the ability to understand the importance of a barometer and what that means for us and to understand if the barometer is falling, what, you know, what would we do with that information? That's really what we're looking at from that coastal skipper yacht master theory level. OK, now for those who teach shore based hand on heart, and I'm going to admit to it first, who over teaches weather? Yeah. 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 yeah, I think so. Yeah. And if you look at it in those terms, what I what I would always say to you is there are some brilliant coulds teach. What are the musts? What are the shoulds and what are the coulds? If you've got a particularly brilliant group who all get it, I've done um, like Coastal Skipper courses where they've been all pilots on it and they're already talking to me or glider pilots and all pilots or whatever. And they're already saying, we know all about this weather stuff. I'm like, great. So we can go a little bit further or actually we can spend a bit more time on the navigation because they weren't so crash hot at that. OK, but it does give you. So what are the musts? What are the shoulds and what are the coulds? Okay. How does that fit into the practical then? And these are roughly, I really appreciate that there's loads and loads of crossover with the courses, but how does it fit in? I've put it into beginner, novice, intermediate, and then advanced applied. Okay. Short trips, bay cruising, afternoon trips, which are usually that power boat level two, sailing level one and two, comp crew, helmsman, PWC type stuff within three nautical miles. Okay usually around and i'm not sure on the days for dinghy so please feel free to correct me but these are kind of all like two i mean comp crew is five days fine but mostly two days ish on the water something like that okay and let's face it, it's the first time a lot of people have ever been in a boat so we'd quite like them to understand how to point the boat in the right direction and how to park it without crashing it and that can take quite a lot of that two days 
Okay. So what am I interested in? Can I have them set some homework that says, can you tonight go obtain me a forecast? And I'd say, particularly like power level two, great one. Can you go obtain me a forecast that you could bring back in tomorrow um, that we could use to make decisions on to go voting? So if they just bring perhaps the BBC, it's going to be sunny. Okay. Can we actually make a decision based on that? Okay. Um, and where to get that information. Sometimes I say to the students, why don't you just pop over to the marina office and go and have a look at what's on the wall? Because it is, it does tend to be on the wall outside. Okay, It's a lunchtime activity perhaps, or it's a homework activity. When I start moving up into the intermediate level then, and I've got sort of intermediate power boat, more day skipper practical, and I think that's where the day sailing and perhaps some of the more advanced sailing courses come in. Um, again, we're only actually looking at record a weather forecast from a radio broadcast. So if those teaching day skipper practical, that is the only practical thing you're supposed to be able to do on a weather syllabus. OK, but we do way more than that, don't we? Because we'll get them involved in doing some of the planning and they'll have a look at what the weather forecast is and how to start interpreting it. OK, then we're up at the advanced applied where we're looking at more the week cruises, the passages, that coastal skipper practical. That's probably the one course that does more sailing and more more miles. That's probably the longest course I think we probably do, isn't it? Um, and then we're into like the advanced power of the practical. Now we're into understanding how to interpret a forecast, how to understand where the system's local effects, barometric trends, using weather to plan a passage. And that's where we start bringing the synoptics into it. Can you interpret a synoptic? OK. And that's really where it goes to. And again, hand on heart, who would be over teaching it? Randomly, I would be because I don't like it. So I do it as minimum as I can. Um, just in Kath, with the um, intermediate level, you've got day skipper practical um, and, and I teach advanced powerboat as well. So <laughs> I, I tend to teach a little bit more on the advanced powerboat. But is the recorder weather forecast from radio broadcast pretty much all you're expected to teach them there's no front so, so if you think that they they sort of build don't they so they would have obtained the sort the, the forecast from a level two perspective understood the sources and the significance of that information um and now really you're expecting to be able to rip a board because yes they are going to be doing some planning and hopefully coming to an intermediate power but they'll have done day skipper theory that, that's that's that, that's the usual. That's certainly what we would drive people to do. So that when they come, and I say to people, do your day skipper theory, come do your intermediate power boat, because then we can put it into practice rather than we have to teach it. Then we have more fun on the water, right? So getting that idea of really, how do we make the most out of it being practical? Because there's also stuff that you could signpost to people before they come. I get lots of people saying, I've just done my level two power boat, can I do intermediate tomorrow? Yeah, no because you've got no real, ex you've driven a boat for two days and not killed anybody. Good, well done, good. But you need to go get some experience, okay? So like I say, these are all roughly, and, and you know, you, diff different courses will be, we'll look at it in different ways, okay? So how do we go about teaching it then, okay? So I look at it in this way. I use a forecasting funnel, and you'll see why in a second. And you think, wow, there's some really big words on there, right? hemispheric scales, synoptic scales, meso scales, local scales. What I try and get my students to understand is what is the big picture going on right now in our world? OK, is the weather relatively settled? Is the weather relatively unsettled? So if I just grab my annotate, hang on, bear with me. Get my little spotlight up. OK, so when I'm talking hemispheric scale here, I have deliberately I know that passage weather, for example, goes into a smaller chart. I get that. But I've left it out of that big chart because what is this saying? Yeah. Is it good weather or bad weather? Does it look angry? Yes or no. Does it look nice and settled? If I want some good power boating weather, I'd love it to be super settled. OK, so I'm looking at the colours. I'm looking perhaps at some of these. I'm looking at what's going on from that hemispheric scale. Again, windy. I know windy can zoom in, but I start with that really big picture. OK, what does this look like for my wind strength? OK, then I come down to my synoptic scale where I'm looking at more information. So here I'm now starting to look at my isobars. I'm starting to look at the fronts because I am quite bothered about whether I'm going to get wet or not. 
because that means whether I have to get you know full oilies on or or not kind of thing. So I am almost also interested in that. What does it really mean? And obviously all the synoptics now, when we look on even on the Met Office, we can play it and see the picture move. So it's not just about looking at one individual synoptic. I can watch how that weather moves, okay? Then I come down sort of to my Mizu scale, which is more in this area where I'm looking at sort of the country, if you like, or I'm perhaps starting to look into my inshore waters all the way down to my local scale. So this gives you an example. This is off our, um, the Port Authority here. This is the Avonmouth um, live weather, but well, it was live earlier on today. Um, and this is what I picked up. It's giving me the actually what is happening. So I'm painting that picture in my head of, the world said it was kind of doing this. And then when I looked on my synoptics, they looked a bit like this. Isobars looked a bit like this. High pressure started to look a bit like that. Front started to look a bit like that. What does that mean locally? What kind of wind strengths, perhaps if I look down at my, um, and it says XC weather, this one, what kind of wind strengths am I expecting? Most things are now really well color coded in that, you know, the red things are not great, are they? The redder the things, the worse it's getting. The mm. bigger the arrows, usually the worse it's getting. Okay. So from that perspective, I start to look at these. Would this be a good day to go boating anywhere in the UK? No, few few people shaking their heads. You're already thinking no, but you don't know any information about it, right? You haven't read it. You yeah. don't know any information. What do you know? There's a big red line around the UK. Right. Yeah, there's a big red line around the UK. There's four six winds forecast within this forecast. Might be great yeah. now, but rubbish later. So I need to then go and have a look at what is my more local forecast and actually what is it really doing here? Because some of these areas are quite big. And for example, if I take our area down here, you know, number nine, I'm looking at this, what could be going on at Land's End could be vastly different to what's going on at the top end of the channel here. Hugely different. It could be blown an absolute hooli down at Land's End and I've got beautiful weather. So although I start there, I then go and say, what is the reality? Okay. When I teach, I have these as weather modules. Okay. This is what I look at having for my weather modules. Introduction to weather. I'm going to, I'm not going to take you through all of them, just in case you're thinking, holy cow, Kath, you really can go on about weather. Okay. I'm not going to take you through all of them. What I am going to do is just take you through a few that might help. Okay. We're doing a quick introduction to weather to get that idea of what is weather. Yeah, for a starter for 10. Then we can go to weather sources. And you guys have all taught courses. You must have students who come to your courses with the latest and greatest weather app that you've never heard of. And they think it's amazing because Joe in the pub showed it to them and said you can't possibly live without it. And you go, great. It's just a weather app. OK, there are loads. Getting people to understand maybe from the, the sources then and then they go, hang on, this weather app over here says something, and this other weather app over here says something different for the same place. How does that work? How are you going to answer that one? Because surely they're all right, aren't they? No? Depends where they get the data from. You're sometimes explaining to students, this is just somebody who is clever at coding, who has managed to take a weather forecast from somebody like the Met Office or Met Erin or some of the other European models, and badge it into some really clever, cool stuff. And it's got animated things on it and you can change the views and you can make colors and you can do all sorts of stuff, but nonetheless, the information is not necessarily theirs. The apps are taking information from other places. That's really quite important. Talk about definitions. I will pop a couple of slides up that one. Then we get into pressure systems. Best way to teach pressure systems, go and look on the Met Office website and go and use the Weather Bytes videos. Don't be trying to draw things on a board. Don't be trying to explain something that students just do not even have a comprehension of. Okay? Pressure systems, warm front, cold front. Um, the way I'd explain it is if it's a front, it's called a front because it is a battle between warm and cold air. Okay, yep. Frontogenesis, it creates a front. It's like armies fighting at the front. That's exactly what it's doing. If there is a fight going on there, then someone has to win either the warm winds or the cold winds, but it is a warm army fighting a cold army, frontogenesis, okay? For picking up synoptic charts, yes, do I print one out and put one in front of my students and say, what will the wind strength be? Yeah, for sure. 
but actually I watch them, I get them to watch the picture changing. Where are these weather systems going? Why are they going that way? We'll come to that in a second. Um, from clouds, there is one slide I can use to teach clouds, which has got all 10 different types of clouds on there. Just the one slide. There's loads of other stuff, but there's just, there's 10 different types of clouds, okay? Fog, again, more, we're much better on videos or animations if you can find them. And then the winds and the local effects is where I start talking about anabolic, catabolic winds, coastal divergence, all that kind of stuff. And then I'll pop some teaching tips up. So, done quite a lot of talking. Over to you guys. What are the four major weather elements? What would you class the four major weather elements as? Any thoughts? Pressure. Pressure? What kind of pressure? Um, Under pressure. <laughs> pressure. Under pressure. Yeah, air pressure. Okay, brilliant. What's air pressure? What is it? Wait, wait, the air pressing down. You mean you mean there's air pressing down on me? <laughs> yeah, pressing <laughs> down on you. <laughs> Where did that come from? Who knew? Okay. All right. So yeah, so somebody air pressing down on me. So air pressure, what else? Precipitation. Okay, close. Moisture. What else do we make weather out of? Moisture, isn't it? It's water. Temperature. Moisture. Temperature, yes, I like that. So temperature we can have, definitely. Okay, air pressure we can have. Uh, moisture and humidity we can't have yet because you've got to get the one on the bottom left first. Uh, wind. Wind, brilliant, okay. And this is how I start all of my weather lessons, okay, particularly from the shore-based side of the house, okay. But what is weather? Because weather means lots of different things to people. If people are turning up for a power level two course, they just want to know whether they're going to get wet or not. Pretty much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perhaps some of the lower levels at dinghy sailing because of the limits that we're looking at going out in. We just need to know whether the kids need waterproofs today or not. Yeah. That's kind of that's some of the decisions, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So everything we talk about in weather, whether we're talking about pressure systems, whether we're talking about fog, whether we're talking about the Beaufort scale, everything is to do with these four elements. And if they can start to see that these four elements, you know, bits of these four elements and more or less of these four elements are what's going to create our weather. OK, the fact that we have warm and cold air. OK, it's chillier at the poles than it is at the equator. Okay relatively simple i would say most of us if we're not already somewhere nice and hot and sunny would go south for our holidays yeah we'd go south for our holidays go chase some sun and people will understand that the further towards the equator we get the warmer it tends to get and of course even when we talk about cold fronts and warm fronts and warm sectors and cold fronts it's about that change in temperature Pressure slightly more difficult to explain. That's why I was joking saying, do you mean there's pressure pushing down on me? Ooh, where did that come from? Okay. But it's the changes in the pressure. And then wind. Okay. What is wind? Um, movement of air. The movement of air. Brilliant. Okay. It's just air moving around the world. Sometimes it doesn't move very fast. Other times it's pretty catastrophic. Okay. But how these pressure systems develop will create that wind. How angry a system is will depend on how much wind we have. And then I think we did say precipitation. It's not a bad shout, but it's merely more about that humidity. How much vapour is in the air? Okay. Yeah. Have I got warm, wet air? Have I got cold, dry air? Where has that come from? Okay. <clears throat> Relatively simple and even for teaching for kids, okay, because we were talking this morning and saying about getting kids perhaps to understand that it will get a little bit windier as the day goes on, as it heats for the sea breeze. Most people can imagine how you put a hot air balloon in the scan. How does it work? We, we add heat to it. What happens? The balloon expands. Certainly, I mean, where we are in Bristol, we have the balloon regatta. Everybody knows how balloons work, okay? But the fact that it expands, if it expands, it's taking up more room. So what does that mean? So then I have a look at my warmer air becoming less dense. My cooler air becoming more dense. So I'm already introducing to students, it's not just about warm and cold, it's about warmer and cooler. Okay. 
how do I bring in high pressure versus low pressure? Because this is where most people are with me on this when I'm teaching. Most people, depending on what, what, what sessions it is, they kind of go, yeah, yeah, I can kind of get this. And then we bring in high versus low pressure. And this is where it starts to often come off the rails a little. So here is my simple cycle. It's that hot air balloon rising. Even if we're talking about kids, say how many kids have stood looking at a bonfire and watched all the embers being pushed up above the bonfire? How did that happen? How, how did that, you know, because they're not on rockets, are they? Something is pushing them up. What is pushing those embers up? OK, so the fact that we've got the hot air rising and then coming back down to sink and what it gives us is an idea of a low and a high. So if it's not pushing down as much because it's rising, it's creating that area of low pressure. If it is starting to sink, it's creating that area of high pressure. So we can just use some simple terms. Yes, I know that you're going to tell me that the world spins and it doesn't quite go around in that circle and so on and so forth, but keep it really simple. OK, otherwise I get I start to get lost because even then, if I bring in my sea breeze and my land breeze, how can I teach this? We've already talked about how important it is. I get that cycle. If I want to up the level, I can say to people, OK, so where is the high pressure and the low pressure then? So the difference of teaching sea breezes, perhaps for level two students would be, yes, OK, it's getting much hotter. This is what's happening with the warm air. This is what's happening, being replaced by the cool sea breeze. Intermediate students, I might be saying, OK, so which is high pressure, which is low pressure? Advanced students, I might be expecting them to be able to explain it to me. Same with the land breeze. OK, some simple pictures. And then we go on to global winds. And now you're thinking, really? Come on, Kaz, global winds, that's a bit A-level. But what's important? <clears throat> yes, we know that there's a whole lot of cycling going on with this hot air rising and falling. OK, yes, we can talk about all the different cells. But actually, what I'm interested in is that we're looking very much at our predominant weather. So if my predominant weather is going to be westerlies, that's where my weather systems are coming from. If my predominant weather is to be trade winds, and I talk about, and um, for those of you who might have been looking to go sail across the Atlantic or something, why does the arc start in the Canaries? Why, why do we go there for it? Why don't we just set off from Land's End? Portuguese trades, isn't it? Okay. So already there may be some things that people are aware of, and these are the overall weather systems, okay? Now, Coriolis effect, yeah, like I said, blame it on the fact that the Earth spins. Just, just as easy. Blame it on the fact that the Earth spins. It does. It spins, therefore it has an effect, okay? Probably mostly need to keep it there. Doesn't need to be much more complicated. And then I move on to my jet streams and say, okay, why is it important? Big ribbon of air. OK, big conveyor belt. All of my weather systems are going to sit on this big ribbon of air. Somehow that is going to bring all of my weather systems and where it is will depend on what weather I get. OK, 200 mile an hour ribbon of wind. Keep it really simple. OK, think of it a bit like a travelator. Like I said um, this morning, when we go to the airport, some of the bigger airports, you've got those big travelators. OK, if I stand on a travelator to walk to a gate, I need to use less, <laughs> less of my own power. It's adding energy to it. So I'm getting there faster. So that's like a whole load of weather systems sitting on that ribbon of air. The angrier this is, the more it's blowing, the more angry it will blow into some of those systems. OK, um, for when we're looking at teenagers or kids, mostly most people have seen Finding Nemo. They'll understand global currents because they watch the little, the little um, turtle who has to go and jump on the back of the bigger turtles in the eastern, uh, was it the eastern Australian current or something like that. It's a yeah. big ribbon. It's a big travelator. It's like a ride almost. This is a ride for all of those weather systems coming from America to us. OK, sometimes it's not such a great ride. Sometimes it's an amazing ride. And then how do I put my weather, my um, weather masses into it? OK, keep it really simple. Red, warm, blue, cold. OK, yeah, I know it changes and we get warm weather in the in the summer, but actually We've got this tropical air mass coming in. If it's tropical, coming from the tropics, we go on holiday to the tropics, it'd be warmer. It's coming across the Atlantic. If it's coming across the Atlantic, it's bringing water with it because it can't bring anything else with it, can it? It's just going to bring that moisture with it. If it's coming up from the continent, it's coming across land. It can't bring water with it because there's no water there to bring. 
So keep it really, really simple with people. If my air is coming down from the Arctic, it already sounds cold if it's coming from the Arctic, doesn't it? It's got to be cold. Mm -hmm. We're going to get warm air from the Arctic, are we? So <laughs> not yes, yet. it's not, not, not yet. Maybe, maybe if I was teaching this in 50 years, this might be all completely irrelevant now, might it? I'm going to have to move on to something else. Yeah. Think about it. yeah. But what is it that's coming? People say to me, like at the moment, why are we getting snow? I said, well, what makes snow? How do we make snow? What are you going to make snow out of? Water. Uh, rain. Water. And, and it's cold. So it's just cold yeah. rain, right? Pretty much. So yeah. we're going to have to have some moist stuff that's going to have to come some way over from the Atlantic to bump into some cold stuff. Yeah. If warm moist bumps into cold and it's cold enough to freeze, it's going to fall as snow. Yeah, talk about the beast from the east, how that came in from the east and it sat there with really cold temperatures. Mm. Okay. And that's really my intro to weather. Okay. I haven't talked about force anything. I haven't talked about sea state anything. I haven't talked about depressions. I haven't talked about frontal systems. What I have talked about is just how does it even work? Big picture stuff. Now, can I get this into a level two power boot course? No. Do I start my day skippers with this? Yeah, absolutely. Because if they know where the weather is coming from, then when they go and look at that chart and say, OK, so I get synoptics, I've looked at it and the weather is coming from here. I expect it to be. They're making some better decisions for me. Yeah, they're making much better decisions. So let me have a look if I can pop back up. How seafaring is this? Well, it's not, but it reflects real life, and that's what they understand. Yeah. So, yes, I could go and show you lots of lovely pictures of horrendous sea states, but let's face it, any kind of hurricane force phenomenal waves, I mean, other than looking at a picture and going, that should be in the movies, we're not really interested. So I keep it simple, and I talk about the things that they can see on the land, okay? So flagpoles. Wise old man, long, long ago told me a skipper I sailed with, if that flag is completely out from that pole and it's not dropping at all, it's blowing at least a force five. And then we're back to, it wasn't that a decision point that we decided on? Yeah. Now, where to go? whether to go or not, absolutely. Now, dinghy sailors, if you're talking about the more advanced end of the dinghy sailing scheme, you might have your students waiting for that flag to be doing that because you might want them to be going out finding that wind. Whereas I might be wanting, say from a power level two perspective, def I definitely don't want that unless I've got some local effects that I can overcome. What is it doing to trees? Because they can see trees. They might not have seen the sea yet. So there's no point showing the picture of what it might look like with white caps on the top of it. Because if you walk from the car park to your boat and you're in a harbor and you've got a wall to go, you haven't even seen the sea yet. Quite often here, we walk the students to the end of the breakwater and say, let's go have a look at it first. Just because it's not windy in the marina doesn't mean it's not going to be windy around the corner. Yeah. So what does it mean that the trees are moving? What does it mean that the big trees are moving? It means it's going to be quite breezy, you know, and if the roof's coming off your house, I'm going to say it's not a day to go sailing. Mm. But, but keep it really, really simple because we can do loads of tables like this. But again, what's going to be the easiest thing to do? Try and get everybody to learn all of this or understand what it means. OK, yeah, okay. I mean, I mean phenomenal, it's... you've got to remember, isn't just 14 metres, it's just 14 metres and onwards. So it's just really big. OK, but what does it mean? Most of the stuff that we are talking about going to see in is down here, isn't it? We're only at two metres, really. Maybe, maybe three, maybe four. And I know perhaps a bit further offshore, you might be picking up some bigger waves. But if we're talking about rough and very rough, most of the forecast is a no. <laughs> mm. Most of that forecast is a no. So where's the decision point for me? Moderate. Once I'm moving out of moderate, we're probably into bumpy. Like I said, great if I'm going report handling but not so great for a comp crew course, perhaps. 
because the idea is that they enjoy the week sailing, isn't it? And, and they come, come back, back more. And they come back. Yeah, same with level two. There's no point me taking part of level two students out and scaring the absolute bejesus out of them. And then coming in going, that was a bit bumpy. Yeah. But again, just simple things like that about how I would teach it. Okay. Even when I look at something like visibility, <clears throat> what do I need to know? Here you'll see I've got some pictures. This is local, so I could pick on Andy and he could he could tell me all about these ones because I know he knows they are. Now he's looking. <laughs> now he's looking at them. But this is about not just understanding what the definitions are, but what can I see? Some of the guys this morning talked about, can you see the Isle of Wight, yes or no? If you can't, what's the visibility that you're sitting in? So for me, I've got the bridge. So it's about five miles from Portishead here to the M4 bridge. I can go and get the students to stand on the breakwater and go, can you see the bridge, yes or no? If the answer is no, we haven't got good visibility. Something like a little island here, we've got Denny Island there. Can I see it? Because it's a couple of miles away. Can I see the boy here? So I get to start looking at how I would teach it by making it more practical to what they can see. And do you know what? Even if you're teaching shore-based, you don't have to stay in the classroom. I haven't seen anything in any of the shore-based syllabuses that says you may not leave the classroom because it's a shore-based course. Go, go look out the window, go walk around to the harbour, go have a look. If you've got the luxury of doing that, great. Similar thing with my timing. Put a forecast up. What does that mean? Okay. Where do these words come into this? So there's lots that I can do to make it much easier for me. Okay. All of this is just about how you sell it. But if you sell weather as the most dull, I hate this topic and the RWA are making me teach it because it's in the damn syllabus kind of instructor, where are your students going to be? Same place. Because <laughs> yeah. you've just, if you're teaching shore base, you've just made the heads explode by showing them that they're going to have to draw triangles on charts yeah. and work tides out and go and do all of that other stuff. And now you want me to work out more complicated physics and meteorology and stuff. Okay. So you've got to have that level of oomph behind you to get it across to them. It's about how does it help you be a better sailor? How does it help you be a better skipper? Okay. Um, very quickly, let me just find, just conscious of time, if I come down, a couple of things that I do use to teach. Um, I will share this with you if I can pop it up on the right screen. I love everybody playing this game now. Uh, there we go, screen share. Work your sea state definitions out. Everyday objects. All everyday objects. Now, of course, it implies that you have an idea of what they are already. So is it a good consolidation? Maybe the grid that I give you isn't completely empty. Maybe there are some already written into the grid. Okay. okay. And if you're interesting, if you're interested, these are actually international rugby posts, which have to be apparently at least 16 metres tall. Okay. <clears throat> Get them thinking about it. What is bigger than what? Okay, something really simple like that. Just get some filling in a grid. Okay, Let me have a look. I think. Uh, crikey. Let's have a look. Got the wave height game. Got that one in there. And my quiz. If I pop these up. Um, online videos. We've we've mentioned a little bit. Don't underestimate the online videos. I pop the screen share back up. Where the bikes met off is I can't, you know, stress them enough. They're brilliant. They're also quite short, which means that actually if I'm sending students home, say, and I'm saying on a day skipper course, tomorrow we're going to be talking about weather fronts and pressure systems. These are short, like five minute videos. That's realistically the kind of homework that they could go and do. OK, um, <clears throat> we've put some stuff I taught. I know some of you may have been on the sessions. I did a whole load of teaching, free teaching in lockdown one and lockdown two. Um, we've got some sessions on frontal pressure systems and intro to meteorology that are on our um, uh, YouTube channel under training tips, stuff that you can go away and watch, or you could direct your students to go and watch if they're if they're coming out of your weather sessions looking a little bit you know bemused, going mm, I'm not really getting that. Yeah, you haven't necessarily got the time to pick up on them. And how do you learn more? 
Met Erin, Met Office. So Met Erin is the Irish one. I see that they've got a whole load of education stuff on there. They quite often, and follow podcasts. Follow them on Twitter, if you're on Twitter. Every now and then the Met Office or Facebook, they pop up something like, how do thunderstorms form? Why can't we predict thunderstorms? And they say, well, if you boil your pan of water on the stove, can you predict where all the bubbles are gonna be? Oh, now I get thunderstorms. That's a bit obvious now, isn't it? Yeah, I just added a load of heat to a whole load of metal and off it went. So a lot of the stuff on there, synoptic charts. If you go onto the synoptic charts page on the Met Office, there is a button to click, guidance on synoptic charts. Takes you away to another page so you can direct people to it, okay? Can't stress something like GCSE bite size, weather systems. It's already talking about depressions, cold fronts, warm fronts, okay? Particularly if I'm looking at a younger audience. Okay, so if I've got some pretty good dinghy sailors, perhaps who are trying to get up to that level at teenagers, you want them to start getting there. Um, and then Marine Weather University. Um, I came across this, actually. It's a chap who does, I can't remember his name now, a chap who does um, some of the forecasting for some of the America's Cup sailing. OK, there was some free stuff. There's some expensive stuff on there. Some of the courses are quite expensive, but every now and then they do a free webinar. It's perhaps worth signing up to something like that where you can jump onto a free webinar and learn a little bit more. OK, loads and loads and loads of stuff. So I will bring you back. I will say any questions. I'm probably going to be inundated with questions or you're just thinking, give it up, Kath. It's like four o'clock. It's time to go home. <laughs> Any questions, any thoughts, any gems of information that you think I haven't covered? I'm oh, really good. A um, little question that I get asked, um, we talk about cold fronts moving faster than the warm front and they occlude. What, what is it that makes the cold front travel faster to catch up with the warm front? So I would say go watch the Weather Bites video on that one because that's a really Weather good Bites. one. Yeah, go watch the Weather Bites video on it. Uh, let me have a look. Here we go. What can I pop up onto the, to the screen? Uh, well, I think if you can look at the density of the air, then yeah. that's, that's one of the, the big challenges. Because when, let me see if I can just pop the screen share up there with me. Um, I'll pop it. It doesn't matter that it's not in slideshow. There we go. I'll pop it up anyway. I think you guys can probably see it. OK, um, when I'm teaching what the life of the depression is, what I'm interested in is saying to people, actually, it is about the density, the density of the air. And this is where I'm getting my rain. This is where I'm getting my rain. And actually, with the warmer air, that's why my cold air is being able to travel more quickly. But again, you've got to say there's, there's a point which you say to the students because it does. It does yeah, I like that. Yeah. OK. <laughs> it was kind of cool. The, Sorry, I think I do the gravity cold air pull gravity down from low to from high to a low pressure. Yeah, yeah That's why absolutely. It's quicker than the high. Yeah, because we're always talking about. For me, it's the so what we know that the winds are going to be stronger around the backside of that low pressure, don't we? So mm. actually, that's where we're expecting those those stronger winds. So it is, yeah, whole heap of, about the, from a gravity perspective. But realistically, what is it going to mean to me? That's where I'm yeah. expecting to have those stronger winds. And again, it's a great question, but for me, that's a could have. Yeah. Yeah, that sits for me firmly in that could have, okay? Because it's one of those rabbit holes, and I know for anyone looking at doing um, sort of CI courses, YMI courses, or any instructor courses, really, there are those rabbit holes that your instructor trainers will just say, how about this? And you jump right into it with both feet. And 20 minutes later, you're still talking about it and you go, that wasn't the question, was it? Yeah. So, so there's quite a lot of that, okay? But yeah, and, and even some of the animations, I think if you can find, I had a brilliant animation, but it was all in Flash, so it doesn't work anymore, which is a real shame, otherwise I would have shared that one with you, okay? But thinking about what is the life of that depression, having some nice pictures, let me see, that actually show you what is happening. Okay, so yes, I've got my warm air here. Yes, I've got it being lifted abruptly. It's a nice big wedge coming in. And remember, this is a fight. It's a front. Mm. The army have marched to the front. It is a fight. That cold front is winning, isn't it? Okay, so in this instance, yeah. the cold front is winning. And what does that mean? It means it's bringing that cumulonimbus cloud. It's bringing that rain. Then it's going to be bringing me some squally weather. So just when I'm happy that it's kicked all that warm, near wet stuff out of the way, Okay, <clears throat> then I've got my squally stuff to worry about behind it. Okay, 
And all of these pictures, please don't think that I'm some kind of, you know, magic guru with drawing things. I'm really not. They're all stolen off the internet. Probably shouldn't have said that, should I? If it goes up on the internet later. But, but none of these are anything that I have created myself, okay? And you'll see, even when we're looking at what the weather front is, what actually happens, I'm starting to see to the students, here is my little fight going on. Colder air, warmer air. Doesn't mean it's warm. Just means it's warmer than the colder stuff. Because otherwise it would always be warm in the winter when we had a warm sector and that doesn't work, does it? Okay, so warm or colder, back to that whole temperature piece. Okay. Does that answer your, help answer your question? Perfect, yeah, that's good. Right. Yeah. Any other questions, thoughts? It will stand into silence. No, I, 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 I've actually taken loads from this. Uh, I will say I watched your uh, two um, YouTubes uh, mm -hmm. the, over the last few days, and they are, guys, they're really good. Um, I, I, I found them. They gave me a lot of information. They'd be great for students. Oh, they're impressive. Okay, thank you. Um, and then you can put me on pause then as well. I appreciate you have been able to put me on pause this afternoon, but you can put me on pause if you watch me on YouTube and go away and get a cup of tea and think, God, does she ever give up? <laughs> right. Okay, fab. In which case, what I will do, let me 